Okay. We're back. Here we have our man Shekante Job. Uh, brother was just mentioning Shekante. Uh, he's he's a physicist, scientist, historian, Egyptologist extraordinaire. And among other things, he's one of the ones that demonstrated beyond any shadow of a doubt the black Africanness of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Uh, there's, um, if you look in different places like the uh, UNESCO um, history volumes on Africa, you'll see some of the proceedings showing that how far ahead and how much work he and uh, Theophil Obenga and those did uh, to demonstrate the black Africanness of ancient Kemet. And uh, all the rest of the Egyptologists were just basically standing there flat footed, even though they had all their credentials and PhDs, because no one has really challenged it to the depth that Sheik Anta. So for us, that's already done. You know, we don't go back to folks saying, oh, we, ancient Kemet was black. And we just know that as a fact and we keep on moving. We try to make sure our children know it. Because in this country, they see so much on Egypt, especially with the biblical literature and all of that stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something they need to know. Uh, we'll go, Dessalane, we'll talk a little more about uh, the whole Haitian Revolution. Dessalane is the one, of course, came after Toussaint, renamed the place Haiti after the original, you know, the original people there called it Haiti. Of course, it was Santa Domingue under the French. And then we talk a bit. Well, now, what the children are most fascinated about this is that they have all seen and heard and read about Napoleon. You see, here in these school systems, Napoleon and Caesar and this right. and that. So it, it helps us in a way because we say, well, these are the people who defeated Napoleon, mm -hmm. kicked him off the island, and started their own republic. Right. They're like, wow, somebody beat Napoleon? I said, yeah, these brothers and sisters right here. Yeah. You know, so um, that's really what's important about getting the Haitian, uh, Haitians on the wall. And of course, we talk a little more about their biography. Uh, George Washington Carver. Um, for us, you know, we even even we think about the peanuts, you know, mm -hmm. the peanut, peanut butter and all More that. Than that. But I mean, if you ever get a chance to see what this brother was thinking about, mm -hmm. if you ever get a chance to go to Tuskegee and go to the museum, I mean, his ideas, of course, on crop rotation and just his knowledge. He was the agricultural genius yes. probably in the world at the mm -hmm. time, you know. Uh, I don't know. I... I don't know if it's true, but I've seen something on it. They talked about even uh, Gandhi mm -hmm. uh, contacting him for some just living advice, you know what I mean, in terms of nutrition and this kind of thing. So uh, he was above and beyond the rest. Of course, he was at Tuskegee mm -hmm. all of that time. He could have gone anywhere, but he stayed there, which is another reason I have George um, Booker T on the wall further down is because, you know, he still maintained that institution for people like this who had to do the work. Uh, Nerere, of course, um, one of our great African leaders, they tried to put a kind of a, I hate to use the word socialism because it's misconstrued, but uh, African social systems where the cooperation and all of these things. He tried to really incorporate that into the soul of Tanzania as they came out of the colonial process. Of course, one of the founders of OAU. Another main reason I have him on there, because when you start looking at these people who are fighting in the in the um, southern Africa, so-called frontline states, you know, Tanzania was always providing a, a launch pad for training, for even launching, you know, their military endeavors in Angola yes. or into uh, Mozambique and this kind of thing. So he wasn't just a, a diplomat and a nice guy. He also knew something about the, the realities of power. Ephraim Mamu, if you live here in Ghana, you'll hear he does one of the uh, national anthems they use. But the reason he's on the wall is when I first read about him uh, on a book called Ephraim Mamou, the African. Mm -hmm. I mean, he went above and beyond probably anybody to maintain the Africanness, you know, because the European were coming with their music, their dress, their this, their that. He's like, we're not, we're not accepting all that. We're not internalizing all of that. We're going to do it the way we do it. He's from Peke. He's an Ewe man. Peke is just there in the Volta region. So I just, his determination to hang on to the African culture uh, made me want him to be on the wall. Harriet Tubman, now we all know Harriet Tubman, and I guess they even have the movie out, Araminta, last year or something. I didn't see it. But um, for the Ghanaian youth, this is when I get to tell them really about American slavery. 
because they know they don't they don't really know about it. You know, you just assume they do, right. mm -hmm. and they knew something happened to get you over there. <laughs> but um, you know, and I tell about what she did in terms of rescuing us and getting us out of that condition. But one time, and you probably see me say it on another video, I had gone down here a little bit, and uh, the children were around here talking, and I didn't know what they were talking about, so I asked the teacher, and I guess I said while I was talking about us working being there for all of those hundreds of years without getting paid on the plantations. And they picked up on that not getting paid part. Mm -hmm. So then I came, then they looked back and they said, we thought, they said, they thought you said you had never been paid. I said, no, we weren't paid. They were like, ah! Mm -hmm. So I said, so you, you know, that's what now I understand why they think we always got money because they figure 400 years of checks every Friday, we should have something to show for it, you know, something, something you know, just a little yes, something, yes, you know. Yes. So, but really, this is how thorough, mm -hmm. you know, we brainwashed and misinformed and misdirected they have our people globally. So we don't let the children go until they know what's going on. And then I told you I take them upstairs and give them the next level of depth when we have, depending on the school and the time. Uh, Samora Michelle, Mozambique. Some of you may know him. He was um, a nurse by training. <clears throat> he, he's on the wall for a couple of reasons. Number one, you know, I've read a couple of books on him. His determination as a soldier, you know, and keeping his people motivated, keeping his people going. I mean, it's really something when you read about him. And you read about how the soldiers talked about him, you know, always out in the front running, always, you know, pushing the pace, always doing this thing. Now, that's one thing. And the second thing is that, <clears throat> you know, he took on the mantle of Manlani. You know, Manlani, you may have heard of Eduardo Manlani, who was, was down here, too. But after Manlani died, I mean, he really, really came in there and did it right. Now, he was based, when he started his first invasions in 64, uh, he was in Tanzania. You know, so Dar es Salaam, I mean, they organized it, gave them a base for operations to launch to fight the Portuguese into northern Mozambique. And he was the one that led that. And of course, the third thing, he's the one that really uh, helped gel, gel um, Frilimo, uh, which is the organization, anti-colonial uh, party, really, that uh, worked so hard against the Portuguese. And of course, he was killed in an airplane accident uh, in South Africa, where we all think that was uh, inside yeah, job, is. inside <laughs> job. Nani in Jamaica, this one is uh, very interesting for a lot of the Ghanaians because Nani uh, is like yeah. Nana. Yeah. He says, okay, he's born in Ghana and then of course gone over with the slave trade and the whole thing. And she was one of the great Maroons, you know, and mm -hmm. if those of you in Jamaica, you know, the Maroons yeah, yeah. are the people back in the slave times who escaped and form their own societies and this kind of thing. Still have it. And they still have it. And so, you know, she was so powerful in her time, the, Brit the British basically had to give her their, her, her own piece of the, mm -hmm. piece of the, the island. Right, right. And I guess they still have Nanny Town they or Nanny have, something, yes, yes. district or whatever it is mm -hmm. today. Uh, and then the, and for the Ghanaians, it's interesting because there's these names, a kampong, mm -hmm. which is like a champong, uh, uh, termiteng, kermiteng, these kind of names. Kujo, these are all these are all icon names. So you know when they hear that these names are still surviving mm -hmm. in Jamaica, it gives the youngsters some idea of the global scope of this thing. You know that okay, we were here, our names are still there. So they start thinking about Jamaica. And it's one reason I put the Jamaican flag up here because Ghanaians have kind of a fascination with Jamaica. A lot of it has to do with the reggae. But also the culture, and there's a lot of Jamaicans here, as you probably know. But a lot of Jamaicans think they came from here. And a lot of them <laughs> obviously did. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people even some of them, mm -hmm. like when you see Jamaicans here, mm -hmm. and you see how they bargain on the roadside, mm -hmm. you know, you don't know the difference between right. them and Ghanaian women. I mean, they're <laughs> on it, boy. Uh, of course, Haile Selassie. Uh, of course, a lot of the children here now, if they've heard the name Haile Selassie, he just heard it on a, on a reggae song somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rastafari, so when I explain to them, you know, he was born Leish, Tafari, Makonan, right. and they hear the Tafari, and I say, and then Ross is like, you know, royal, young royalty coming up. Leish is like royalty as a child. Uh, Ross is like, you know, as you're coming up, young royalty. So he's Rastafari, Makonan. And so that's the first time. 
I've even had a couple rosters, to be honest with you, hadn't pulled that together. Oh, yeah. It was just roster, roster, roster. <laughs> and I said, Leeds, ro Leeds, anyhow. Um, but he's, that's what they always want to know about him. And then I try to tell him a little bit about how he, you know, tried to reform uh, certain things, his struggles against the Italians, uh, his way he came to power, because it could have very easily been a, a Muslim, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because the one that he was vying against as it's coming through was pushing him toward Islam. Uh, of course, they were their uh, traditional Christian religions. But boy, you, all of these things, he's all part. Uh, Pianchi, PA, of course, this is uh, Kemet, the 25th dynasty, and as Dr. Clark calls it, I think the Africans last walk in the sun or something in Kemet. Right? So now we're talking 714 before the common era. Pianchi was, um, you know, the, the founder of the 25th dynasty. So this gives me a chance to explain to them once again about African Kemet and then how uh, other people started to infiltrate the place and then how in the 25th dynasty coming back up from Sudan we were able to kind of re reinstitute the black power of course in the Nile Valley and the PA and uh, a lot of them following him uh, were important in that process. Shaka, Shaka the Zulu King, I always, I took this straight from the movie because okay. I like that picture. I like the brother who played yes. him. I don't know, yes, yes, I don't yes. know what he's about, but boy, they couldn't, as far as I was concerned, they picked the right guy for the role. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so we're using it, that, that, you know, picture. Um, we like to, we we'll tell the children a little bit about the, you know, the, the difference in fighting modes, you know, how he had this shorter mm -hmm. jabbing mm -hmm. thing and the bigger shield and, and uh, how he was able to, conquer so many parts of uh, South Africa with the Zulu army expanding. We also try to let them know that, you know, having expanded mm -hmm. that space, it made it more difficult for some of the other people to get in because now it's expanded. So, you know, you don't hear so much about the Europeans having all that much success. Now, there's a couple of reasons. Colonial times, of course, gave them a whole new injection of, of interest. But I mean, they've been in, Afri in South Africa for you know, for a long time. So in the er during this time, they were still around. Like Dr. Clark says, they didn't much penetrate because these people had themselves together. So that's Shaka. Fannie Lou Hamer. Now this is another one with the children. Uh, I let them know that even at my age, when I was their age, mm -hmm. especially the ones that are six, five, four, six, you know, I mean, voting in America for black folks was, was a non-starter. I mean, you know, we on the books we could, but really until we had the Voting Rights Act, you know, and even after that, it was very, it's, it's difficult Today. now. You know, they've got all of these, they might as well have a poll tax on us right now. I mean, the, the, all of the ways they had to make sure we don't have the franchise. But anyway, I tell them about Fannie Lou Hamer and how she was jailed and beaten and tortured and everything, and then how she, you know, came back to uh, make her appeals in uh, 1964 when they were having the Democratic Convention. And you know, you've seen that, is this America? You know, that she's sick and tired of being sick and tired. But it's the main thing to let them know how hard we had to fight just to get the vote. Now we got the vote, still catching hell. I think this work is big. That's what I think. I don't know if it's worth it, but it, 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 it's, it's not worth a whole lot. Togbe uh, Sri, now if you come in from Ghana, so by the way, some of these big pictures that are right here, mm -hmm. uh, you can see this style was all kind of by the same artist, mm -hmm. one of my Rasta yeah. buddies, you know, okay. over here, that way dude, he, he's a musician, I didn't even know he could paint, he said, oh yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I can paint a little, I was like, whoa, mm -hmm. the guy could really get down, but anyway, the Airways, the Anglo, which is one, the southern, the southern Airways, we'll, we'll call them, come from a place, well, we don't know how far back they go, but in, in Togo, there's a place called Noche, and that's supposed to be pretty much where they, they migrated from, down to Togo, and then the southern part of Togo and Ghana, the Anglos, and he's the one who brought them here, and there's a lot of legends about how they got there, how they got here, how they escaped the King uh, Akole, who was supposed to be wicked, they had to walk backwards, and they had all kinds of legends that go along with it, but uh, he is really the one that they, called their patron guy here in the southern part of Ghana anyway. Takitoia, this is a, one of the Ga, Ga Mantis, Ga chiefs. You see, it was around the turn of the last century, or the, you know, 19, early 1900s when he died. 
you know, he's a reformer and a lot of things, but uh, you have to also look at the context. Of it. You know, you can imagine someone trying to keep the sovereignty of the group mm -hmm. right in the middle of this colonial process. I mean, this is you know, 1902. I mean, in the late 1800s, all of this was crazy. So just to be able to maintain some semblance of sovereignty in the middle of all of that uh, is, not a, is not a simple thing. And uh, they did their best. Now this one, <clears throat> this is one I really hit the children with because they all have all of this literature that I was just mentioning to you about ancient Egypt. They've seen all of the movies, Yul Brenner, this, the parents who cried, you know, and all of this kind of stuff. And I say this is 3,100 before the Common Era. So what you're looking at is the actual head. Now this one we have, it's probably, I think, British Museum or something. The actual head of the first pharaoh in the first dynasty, or at least one of the first pharaohs. Some say he was the first. But either way, this is the first pharaoh, first dynasty, ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. So the child looks at this and they compare it. In fact, I've even had a, a little, some of the little literature, you know, that they have, the church literature, stuff that's around for, you know, because the missionaries bring this stuff by, I mean, the crate load of all, I mean. They ready for war, man. man, they play. man I mean, I'm talking <laughs> boxcar loads, man, of all of these little cartoons and all of this stuff. And you'll find that stuff scattered all over Ghana, all over Africa. But White dolls, Ghana, all that good stuff. I mean, but I'm saying all of these little, they, you know, they have these little cartoons, you know, and, and Man, they're really they serious. They focus on the minds of the kids. Yeah, they're, they're little they're cartoons, and so, yes. and then even these little young type animations about yeah, Egypt, man. and they got all of the white. Kill them I mean, before they Canadian, grow. Right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, they, 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 they swamp them with that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so when they see this face, and I'm telling you, this is the real one, because then I'll have a picture of the actual mm -hmm. statue itself when we go up there. And they're like, well, so this is the first, because this looks like the... This looks like the guy they just passed at the Trotro station yeah. this morning, you know what I mean? So, this is obviously not an Arab or a European. Mm -hmm. Damn sure ain't Yul Brenner. <laughs> this, this guy looks so, so cool. And he is cool. <laughs> and you know, everybody's telling me that he's doing some kind of sign down there. That's supposed to mean something. Uh, Trinity, yeah. Yeah, but this is uh, Armacar Cabral, which is probably, I would say, about the short of Garvey about the baddest brother we produced in this anti-colonial era. I mean, first of all, I don't know if you've ever, if you ever get a chance, you should read Unity and Struggle, Return to the Source, and some of his, uh, some mm. of his works. But there in Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, he was able to use culture as the way to organize his people to fight the Portuguese. In other words, I mean, he was like, you, this is who you are. This is what you stand for. This is your culture. This is, this is not just your fighting just for land and all. It's, it's everything. And, you know, and did the job, the work that other people really need to take a note from, which is he was able to get those cultural teachers or reminders out in the field, out in the bush, along the countryside. So people all in the interior all knew what they were fighting for, all knew what they were doing this for, which was a mistake. Some of the other ones, you know, you just show up, you want to fight guys like well what's in it for me or you know why am I fighting now no, so he was very thorough about that and they were really beating the Portuguese down you know and the Portuguese were getting caught up like a little Vietnam and there's so much blood and treasure not just here but it made it easier for the Angola the people in Angola and Mozambique who are also fighting the Portuguese basically collapsing that empire so the very next year 74 you, you may know but the Portuguese had a revolution yep. And they threw all of them jokers out. And one of their big problems is, look, we can't afford to be down there losing our lives and our money and everything. And Guinea-Bissau, why you jokers, you know, waste time. So they had the revolution, and to a large extent, this guy brought it on. And so to the extent that he freed them, he also loosened the chains of these other Angolan, Mozambique, and the other Portuguese colonies here in Africa. Imhotep, you know, we hear about the great Imhotep all of the time world's first known multiple genius. Um, of course, astronomer, scribe, all of the rest, medical doctor. Mm -hmm. And if you watch the video, because I say this all the time, uh, a lot of the times that I had some Ghanaian doctors here one time, and when I mentioned him being the first medical doctor, 
they kind of, you know, roll their eyes. Like, they start thinking about Greece, right? This guy's really, you know, laying it on thick now. They, they start thinking about hypocrisy. Thing, he's taking it way too far, you know. But uh, I told him that and some other things, and we kept going. But one of the guys peeled off and with his Google, mm -hmm. and he came back. He told the other guys, you know, it's true. Mm -hmm. that, you know, <laughs> so Google's you know, a fact. Because they didn't believe it, you know. They have doctor yeah, degree, so just yeah, 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 yeah. Because when they took the Hippocratic, <laughs> they, took the Hippocratic yeah. they took that Hippocratic yeah. oath, they didn't know that Asclepius was in right. hotel. Right, right. You know, and they mm -hmm. broke all that. And the guy came and he was telling them all that he'd been gone about. 20 minutes, you know, mm -hmm. so he was really down in it. Yes, he came yes. back and gave his own little lecture on what he just said. And other doctors were like, I'll be down. Just knew that was a white man. <laughs> you know, still didn't want to, you know, and, you know, sometimes we believe it, but we don't internalize it. Right, you know? right. And they leave right there and go, yeah, that may be so, but you know, I'm trying to get to France to get my advanced degree. <laughs> it's not a little mature. Um, unfortunately, this painting, it was a lighter one, and then we, but I had already glossed everything, and the brother came back and painted it, darkened him up a little bit, and something with that combination uh, caused some trouble on the color, so we're gonna have to redo that. But anyhow, uh, the Great Toussaint, all of this, if you remember some of the earlier ones were, were much darker, but this is where, you know, this Napoleon army again, and uh, tell them about the foam people, the Voudon, how they use culture again, which because religion or spirituality is also culture, obviously. And how yeah. they use that to uh, to kick kick the French out first, and then of course they had to fight the British too. Uh, Nagbewa, Nagbewa is the father of uh, just about all of the northern groups. Uh, the Moshi, Moshi, uh, the Gomba, uh, Mamprusi, Nanumba, all of those come under his line. So. My son does a nice presentation on this because he, since he's from the north, he can he's got a way of pronouncing all of those northern mm. names up there. He, he what can about really... the Dagban people in the north? They, they Dagomba. Come they come under him. Oh, okay. Dagban, right. the, the okay. Gomba. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're all of them. Most of the big so, northern groups. That's the, the man right here. And then, you know, if you listen to like the Mamprusi, the Mamprusis, I have a guy here who drives my thing, he's a Mamprusi, but when he talks to the, my wife, the Grunis, you know, Frafra is kind of a thing that the whites put on it. Because they have a term they say, Farfar, far, which means kind of like, you know, it's a welcoming type of thing, and some whites all they heard was Frafra. So they change it to Frafra. And then, unfortunately, our people, whether they were Gruni, whether they were Nagdam, whether they were all they spoke that kind of language, all kind of took on the Fra Fra uh, thing. That's why I try to say my children and my wife, they speak Gruni, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to the Fra Fra, which is just a name the Europeans put on, because they couldn't quite understand what the greeting was. We got a lot of that in Africa. Uh, we'll say Tutu the first, if he's the first of Santahini. You guys are going to go to uh, Kumasi, so you'll see a whole lot more in them. In the story of a Compa Noche, who was, uh, you know, the spiritual man with them and the golden stool coming down and all of that. They'll give you the full, full wrap when you get to oh, Yeah, Kumasi. we're definitely going to be going through that a lot in Kumasi. Right, right. Uh, Thomas Sankara, this is a young brother who, of course, they assassinated early. You see, he didn't live that long. Um, True revolutionary. You know, young revolutionary. A lot of people say, well, he's too brash. He, he wasn't thinking, he moved too fast and all of that. But sometimes it's that youth that brings that courage, you know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes it has and, to go down uh, like that. And he was completely non-corrupt and incorruptible. Uh, brought a lot of women, you know, in the high uh, echelons of his, his administration, which was something every, no one else was really doing. But the reason they got rid of him is because he said he's not paying all of that doggone IMF mm. debt. It's odious debt. He said, if we pay it, uh, it'll kill us. If we don't pay it, it won't kill you. Because, you know, he's telling the West, hey, you guys, you know what I mean, you, can, you don't need this money. And so when he did that and implored the other African leaders to do the same, I think that was a bridge too far. And you can find some place where it's written where he was telling the Af group of African leaders, he said, look, I'm not going to pay it, and I'm telling you now. He said, if we all go together, you know, yes. we can do this. Strength in but if it's only me, this time next year, I won't be here. He was right. Straight, yep. So it's not easy. I know it's getting hot. Y'all holler when you hurt. <laughs> Amenarenus, an ancient Kush, very important for the children. 
boys and the girls. Mm -hmm. This is the Kandakis, the, you know, what the Europeans call the Candaces. So these queens like the Menorainus, and there's several of them. And now this time in Kush, 60 BC, uh, the Roman, so-called Great Roman Army, is in charge of Egypt. You know, but this is way after all of the real things happened in Egypt. So they're going to push south into Nubia Kush area. And uh, of course they run into this uh, Amenorrhenus and her army. And they say, what are you doing here? And they say, we're the Romans. And she said, that's nice. You go home. <laughs> you don't go home. No, y'all going home. So they had a war and uh, she pushed them home. So what, <laughs> what the children, like I said, the favor they do us in these schools is they get the Roman army. My children, I remember they came home, homework, and we had to know not just the, the uh, colors of the Roman army, the capes, the formations, the, hel the type of helmets, had to know what was on the bottom of the shoes they wore. I mean, all the gory detail about the Roman army. You know, just that's the Roman army. Yeah. So all the children come through here, a lot of them had to suffer through the same thing. Then I said, by the way, she smashed the Roman army, sent them out of her country and crushed them. So, and then they look at her face. Of course, you know, 60 BC, I don't know what she really looked like, but I, this sister looked like how I wanted it to look. That's right, that's right. And they look at her and they go, you mean Caesar and them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm like, damn. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we really need a true global education reform, man. This, we, we need, uh, I mean, so serious. And if we can do that and get that and get that in the hands of our schools, our teachers, our babies, our parents, and even if 5 or 10% of them get it, it'd be a game changer. Yeah, I mean, we have black countries that's teaching all of this white history. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. Like, these people are like geniuses of the world. And, and it's only get better if we make it better, yeah. you know. Us, yeah. Good thing is we're meeting Ghanaians, for instance, that have seen it and they've traveled or they've been here and heard it and then they've been getting the books. And so now I can have a Ghanaians maybe even explaining this when I'm bringing the kids down so they can translate into Dangbe or whatever it is and the children really get it. So we're working on it. Uh, the great Menelik II, uh, Ethiopia, of course we know Ethiopia is the only one who was not uh, conquered by force or colonized by force. And I see she's looking down there. We get about this time, people start looking. How many of these left? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we can, those. we can even pause by Wait. the gate right there. Okay. Uh, okay, okay. So we'll move a little quicker on here. So Menelik, the reason he's here, of course, is because he saw what the, the British and the French and everybody was doing and said, you know, we're just not going out like that. So they got themselves organized, their people, munitions, weaponry, organization, army and everything and they were waiting for the Italians. And when the Italians came, well, it wasn't just waiting. They thought they had an agreement with the Italians. And then the Italians flipped the script and said, what you signed gave away all of this to us. And he said, that's not what I signed. He said, it is what you signed. He said, okay, well, you take that piece of paper over there and I'll meet you on the battlefield, which is exactly what he did. And they were able to repel them and not be colonized like all the rest of them. And uh, of course, the great battle, Adua, 1896, is the one that uh, people talk and write a lot about. The great Malcolm X. I don't have to tell y'all too much about Malcolm. But, about uh, Malcolm, 40 years. He was 39 years old. 39. And uh, if I was them, I would have taken him, taken him out too. Because he was going to change the game. And, uh, of course, Organization of African American Unity, all of that, since we all from the U.S. So take too much time. Chitswu, another one of the great Zulu kings uh, um, <clears throat> down the line of Shaka. Uh, of course they had this fight like like crazy against the British and they have some of these movies out. And I always mention here is these is this is when you can really start seeing the military technology turn the tide. Because we got these Zulus who are organized like you won't believe. They're courageous like you won't believe. They have all their structures and strategies. But you know when they start spitting out them bullets like that, sooner or later they're going to get you. And so that's a lesson I think we haven't learned. We need at least some minimal level of capacity to deter other people. And uh, so we can't do that. What? Yeah, I like and you say, just wait. <laughs> uh, they're playing a different game than the rest of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but anyhow, uh, that's okay. I cannot turn, um, of course, Ancient Kemet, now there's a lot of other pharaohs, there's a lot of other ones that did a lot of things, but he's here mainly because 
they're deeply here in the Christianity, of course. And so we like, and they, you know, Akhenaten is known kind of loosely as a, the father of monotheism. Um, there's a lot more to be said on that because actually what we had before that was actually monotheism too, but you know. But for purpose of the, the discussion with the children, I'm trying to let them know that this, this Hebrewism or Judaism, Christianity, and Islam will come out of the matrix of Nile Valley spiritual systems. And so when we talk to them about, you know, the, the admonitions of Ma'at and all of these things with the Ten Commandments and on and on. So this is, gives us a chance. And if the audience is a little older and educated, we talk about Sigmund Freud and uh, Moses and monotheism and tying that back to the, the whole uh, African origins of major Western religions, as Dr. Ben says. Great Bob Marley. I usually don't have to explain this much to anybody. It's just like Bob Marley is Bob Marley. And uh, they all go, okay, we got that one. Uh, Wangari Mathai, Kenya. I think you'll see on another video, because I usually say this when the guy was painting this, I just gave him the black and white picture and I came back and it was all green. And I, and you know, and of course she's known for planting the millions of trees in, Kem in, uh, in Kenya. And, and really, if you get into her political philosophy, you see why she was persecuted inside of, inside of Kenya because she was a nationalist to the hilt. But um, the guy painted and I said, well, why'd you paint it green? He said, I don't know, I just felt it. I don't, you know. Yeah. And when I explained to him what she, who she was, and, and he didn't look surprised at all. He said, well, maybe that's why I felt it. You know? So who knows what's going on, right? Uh, Singbe Pie, or Sinke, um, a lot of you saw the Amistad, so you know something about uh, what happened there. But for the youngsters, uh, the point I'm making to them is look at everything they did to become, get free from the European on these ships. Mutiny, uh, violence, whatever they had to do with the sole objective of getting back to Africa. Sole objective of getting back home. He said, now, you know, if they put that same ship out there, y'all all swim to it and get on it. You know, and they said, well, we're going to slave you on the other end. They said, that's all right. Let me just get there. <laughs> now, the great Fred Hampton, the chairman, of course, uh, Black Panther Party, Chicago. Now, a lot of times the young people look and say, wait a minute, that's only 21 years. And that's when I explained it. When you have this kind of power in your voice, time. you have this kind of influence in your presentation and your presence. Uh, they're, if they're smart, they get you out early, which is what they did here. But uh, yeah. it's definitely destined for we greatness. We have some nice little uh, video, maybe on YouTube, I don't know, but about the killing of Fred Hampton and, and the intrigue, and of course, some of the, the agents, black agents who work for the FBI, yeah. are also close. Uh, Maharero, um, this the Herero people uh, in South, so-called at that time Southwest. Africa, which is Namibia today, uh, were in, in it with the Germans because the Germans had colonized that area and they had a mass slaughter of these people, running them out into the desert, starving them to death, killing them. Uh, I mean, a scorched earth. If you read uh, General von Trotha and these people who were hitting the German army at the time, it was just one of the most ruthless campaigns you can imagine. And Herrero, being you know head of the group, was doing everything humanly possible to resist, to run, to hide, to fight, and do whatever they could do. They also say that some of the techniques that the Germans used there, uh, they, they showed up later, <laughs> after World War II or during World War II. So what goes around sometimes comes around. Oliver Tambo of South Africa, you know, left South Africa, exiled really, you know, kept the organization for the, uh, the military, uh, resistance programs going in and out of uh, South Africa during that whole period. Really kept the whole, the pulse beat, the whole thing going. Uh, Augustano Neto, this is another, what we call Hotep, Imhotep man instead of Renaissance man. You know, he's a medical doctor. He's a uh, poet and a lot of other things. But the real thing is he was able to, um, you know, pull together MPLA, which is, uh, I forget what it's called, the Popular Movement, the Liberation of Angola. And they were able, of course, to be fighting and fighting against the Portuguese. Later on, he got in a lot of conflict internally after the colonial time was over with the 
you know, FNLA, and then the UNITA, some of you may remember Jonas Avimbe, who was, uh, you know, the West America's boy. And, um, you know, he, he, he died of cancer in Russia in 79. Of course, he was also leading the military struggle too. Zabbas of Haiti, I have this one here to show the youngsters that this girl, starting at nine years old, started running away. They would catch her, torture her, beat her. She'd run away again no matter what happened. She just had that spirit of always resisting. Um, there's stories, there's not a lot written about her, but they talk about how they tried to for, force her to have a child, kind of hoping that that would slow her down, which it did, but eventually the child died. She ended up dying in the end. Basically sounds like reading between the lines like she bled to death because uh, she had some kind of some kind of sugar mill or something and cut her hand and trying to escape. And when they finally found her, she's bleeding, bleeding. Finally, she bled out and died. But from her brief lifestyle, lifespan, from nine years old to, I couldn't tell exactly when she, how old she was when she died. Uh, she fought and struggled to get off that plantation. And she had that spirit at nine years old to know whatever they're doing here, don't succumb. So we're trying to tell our children, never give up, don't succumb. They beret uh, of the Timnay people in Sierra Leone. Uh, this is when I explained to the children about the hut tax. Hut tax was, oh, you said you wanted to stop at the thing. Uh, we can do so, one or two more. Okay, the hut tax is uh, there in Sierra Leone. You know, the British did this everywhere. Actually, they did it in in Kenya and other places, which is in order to finance their operations and their lifestyle and, of course, their profits, uh, they would tell you, you're living in this hut, and you're, you got, you've been in there for 10 generations, your father, grandfather in this area. He, the British said every one of these huts has to pay a tax. You can pay it in pounds, sterling, you can pay it in whatever, but you got a tax. And of course, you've been living in the house forever. So why would I pay you a tax to live in my hut? Said, well, because I'm the British. He says, oh, that's very interesting. Let's go to war. So that's Bay Beret. He fought them and fought them in the, what they call the hut tax wars. But I like to tell that because I, I want the children to know how preposterous some of this stuff is that they do. You know, but when you're in power, you can do preposterous things. But if you're determined, you can resist it. I mentioned upstairs Felix Mumi, he was the one I was talking about when I said that he went to Geneva trying to negotiate with these folks and they gave him the thallium and killed him. The lesson being, you know, even when you're negotiating with the liberals, you're in trouble. That's right. You don't have your own power. Sekohune, uh, down in South Africa region, the Transvaal, he was basically the last real strong chief resisting European domination there in the Transvaal and going down in the Popo area, in Popo area. He struggled against, you know, these stories I tell you. Um, but anyhow, he struggled against the, the Boers and then he had to struggle. And once the Boers got kind of under control, the British looked and said, okay, the Boers who were the Dutch are looking a little bit weak. Uh, so they went in to take over and of course he went to battle against them. So he had to fight the Dutch, he had to fight the, the, the British, and there was a lot of intrigue inside of the family, because his half-brother, I think uh, Mampuru, or Mampuru, was siding with the other guys. So he sided with the other guys to fight against him, and then when he kind of neutralized that situation, uh, they kicked him out of the country. When he came back, the brother, they had made him a chief, because, you know, he was fighting against the real the real deal here and soon they betrayed him ended up killing him you know what I mean so it's one of those situations that you sold your brother out to be the guy and then they when when they finally got him out of the picture they killed him too so, I call you want to close out on this last okay, one okay we'll close out on uh, Nahanda what Nahanda is Zimbabwe um, she was a great spirit woman who gave them the the spiritual impetus to fight on uh, through what they call the first Shemarenga. Sometimes you hear Mugabe talking about the second Shemarenga, which is just the wars of resistance against the British. So uh, she was powerful. And when they finally did get hold of her, instead of exiling her like they do a lot of people, they just hung her at, <laughs> on the spot. They wanted to watch her body dry up. Now, whether her spirit uh, 
they got control of that or not is anybody's guess. The jury's still out, but at least they fought when it was time to fight. So, so, so perfect. So after lunch, family, we're going to hit you with the rest of this. We'll knock out the rest. Yeah, probably about a 20, 30 minute segment. Right. But once again, family, we're documenting everything. And our brother, Jerry's going to tell us about this uh, building wonderful over building there. over there when we get back also. So yeah. stay tuned, family. Yeah, we're doing it.